Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of our new uploads. If you'd like more information about the Net Bible Church or how you could donate, please click on the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Hallelujah. We, especially in the United States, the American gospel, and there are other nations that have gotten under the same watered down gospel that doesn't talk about sacrifice, that doesn't talk about repentance. We need to know that we have to live a life of repentance and sacrifice in willingness to serve this mighty God who has given us everything in his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. He has paid the price that we should eagerly seek his face to find out what his will is for us. Amen? Hallelujah. There will be a general will that is the same for everybody, but there is a specific will that God wants us to walk in. And the only way we find that secret, that secret, specific will for our lives is by getting in his face and letting him show us. We, we will never find out the secrets of God without being in the secret place. Amen? The secrets are in the secret place. And there is no, there is no substitute there is no substitute to find out the secret but being in the secret place. Amen. Hallelujah. There is power. There is more power in the secret place. There is more wisdom in the secret place. Hallelujah. There is more knowledge and understanding in the secret place. There is more joy. There is so much more joy in the secret place. There's so much peace in this secret place. Amen? There's so much love in the secret place. But if we don't go to that secret place, you're like, where is that secret? It, when, you, when you find the secret place, you'll always know where that place is. And it's always a place with you and God. And when somebody talks about the secret place, your heart will melt because you're like, it automatically takes you to that secret place. It's a secret because it's between you and God. Nobody else, just you and God. It's a place that you go in your heart that's just you and the Lord. Amen? It's a place that God provides for every man, woman, boy, and girl from every nation, a place that they can come and meet him. Meet love in the secret place. Come and meet, come and meet peace, the prince. Come and meet the prince of peace in the secret place. Amen. Come and meet your righteousness. Because your righteousness is in Christ in the secret place. Everything we need is in the secret place. So let's get jiggy with it and spend time in the secret place. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, I was just thinking because um, I've been listening to these different testimonies of people from different nations and their background and then how they came to find the Lord. And even though their backgrounds are all wild and crazy and different from one another, when they all met the Lord, it was all the same thing. They met love. They found Jesus. And they found love. And when they stayed in the face of Jesus, they found power. Amen? They found power and joy and rest. And it's funny because they all had the same story. They go, at the end, it's like, it's all about that secret place in him. It's all about being alone with him. It's so vitally important to be in the place where God appoints us to be so that we can hear what he has to say. He does speak to us in the secret place, but he has a message for, I love that because in my secret place, God talks to me about things that, that I should do and that I 
need to be doing and things that I need to change. And he talks to me about, you know, my life and my walk. Amen. And then um, when we come to church, it's about him talking to the church. But in talking to the church, he talks to us as individuals, but it's about the church. Amen. When we are in the secret place, sometimes he'll talk up to us about the church. He'll talk to us about family. He'll talk to us about all kinds of things. Amen. But he'll talk to us a lot about us and personally, you know, about our lives and, and about what we need to change and in, in prayer and what we need to pray for and things like that. But in the church, he's talking to us about the church. Amen. And we're all a part of the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The ultimate relationship that we have with God. It's the ultimate. Let me just look up that word. Why does it want to give me? Okay, I am going to look this up. Um, ultimate. It's last, the furthest, the farthest, the ending of the process and series, the maximum, decisive, conclusive, highest, basic, fundamental, representing a limit beyond which further progress as in investigation or analysis or is possible. It's beyond. <laughs> the ultimate, the beyond the relationship, amen? that we have, we have been given by God through the blood of Jesus. And there is no relationship with God outside of Jesus. There's no relationship with God outside the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that he paid for, for humanity, for whosoever, for whosoever. If there's anybody that's a who, he can be a whosoever, shall believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and they shall be saved. Amen. And so... <clears throat> In 1 John, let's start with 1 John 4, 16. The ultimate relationship is with God. It is with God. The most important relationship that we have as Christians is our relationship with God. In 1 John 4, 16, the New Living Translation says, we know we know how much God loves us and we put and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. So we are putting our hope, we're putting our trust in God, but we're actually placing it in love because God is love. Amen? So having understanding of that, that when we come to God, we're actually coming to the ultimate relationship with the divine kind of love. It's not an earthly love. It's not a physical love. It's not a mental love. It's not an emotional love. It is God, the God kind of love that is God. It's not a possession of God. It's who he is, his very being and essence and existence is love. Amen. In Ephesians 2, starting at verse 1, I'm reading out of the NIV, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So we know that before we came to God, we lived a life of disobedience and we could not help ourselves because we were called sinners. And sinners sin, right? Sinners sin. And so we couldn't help ourselves. We were born into it and we lived out sin. Everything was about us, me, mine, I. <laughs> we were just born into it. Amen? And so we know as, as sinners that are still around today that we used to be one of them, right? 
And he is the same spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That same spirit was at work within us. And all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings, the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. We were led by a ring in our nose. <laughs> The devil could have his way, our flesh, our, un, our minds that could not think like God were having their way with us. Amen. We just followed it around. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath because we had no room, even though God created us with a divine purpose. We refused God. And we lived a life of sin, that means a life of going against God. Just every moment of every day was going against God. That's why people say, well, I didn't kill anybody or, you know, I didn't rob any banks. We lived a life of going against God. And that is the problem when people live, live somewhat of a wholesome good life they don't think that they need that much forgiveness. That's why the Word of God says that much, much forgiven, much loved. They don't, they don't think they were really sinners. But they're, they're living and breathing all day long was against God. No room for God. I don't serve God. I don't worship God. I don't live for God. I don't care what God thinks. I don't even know if I believe in God. I'll do what I want. And a lot of times people get, in the, get, it, get caught up and they, they think they're, what they think and what they're doing is good and right. But it's not in God's sight if it's not for God. Be the kindest person. Mother Teresa, if she wasn't born again, she busted hell right open. I don't know. It doesn't matter the nice things people do and you can give everything you have to the poor. <laughs> you could... Give up your life. But if it's not for the cause of Christ, it's for nothing. Amen. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, but, because of his, but because of his, God's, because of God, because of God's great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, even when every breathing moment of our life was all about us and not about God. Even at that moment, God still loved us and gave Jesus for us. What a love, what a love, what a love. You know, sometimes we think that we love people and, you know, you know, we love and care about people until they do us wrong enough. <laughs> then we're, you know, forget you. I used to have that tendency at one time. Sometimes, you know, as you're young, you get burnt by friends, you get burnt by people. And then after a while, you know, you get a little, start getting a little older. You know, I'm talking about, you know, you know your high school years and then your, you know, your formative years and then your, you know, college career age years. And then you get to the point where you're kind of developing a little like, well, I'll show them. <laughs> like, I ain't putting up with this stuff. I ain't putting up with this attitude. I ain't putting up with this treatment. I ain't putting up with the way they... <laughs> Could you imagine if that was God's kind of love where we would all be? Amen? No, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive, alive, alive with Christ. Even when we are dead in our transgressions, it is by grace, God's grace, his power, his ability. I don't care what kind of faith we have, if we don't have the grace of God, God's power, and God's ability to meet, our, meet what we believe, God and God, we have to have God's grace, his power and his ability in everything we do. Amen. God raised us up with Christ and seated us. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly, in heavenly realms 
in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the in incomparable riches of his grace. What? The same grace, the same grace that we have been saved by. Amen? It's the same grace, the same God through the eons of time. And even in heavenly places where we are seated with Christ, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That means through the eons of time. Through the eons of time. In a thousand years. In ten thousand years. There won't be years. It'll just, there won't be time. <laughs> but through the eons of time. God will have us on display as his rich grace and mercy. Though we did not deserve, a lot of people think they deserve to go to heaven just because they've done some good things. You know, they've helped people and they're kind. They want recognition for all of it. But nobody deserves to go to heaven. Jesus alone paid the price so that we can be seated with Christ in heavenly places. And that in the ordering, the, the coming ages, we have no idea what that even is. The coming ages, we are going to be on display. Trophies in God's case, in God's trophy case. Look at what I can do for somebody that will surrender. Amen. Hallelujah. Incomparable, his incomparable, that he is going to show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So all that sums up, all of our lives, the good and the bad, <laughs> the dark and the light, the tests and the trials and the victories, all of that is going to be summed up through the eons and the coming ages of look what God has done. He will look at you and your life and everybody through all the eons of time can look at you and they will see not all the things you did and missed and all, but they're going to see God's grace. They will look at you and say, wow, that is the grace of God. Now I'm listening to all these testimonies that people have been given, and they tell all these horrid stories. And by the time the story's over, you don't really remember all the details. You just knew they had a horrible background. Amen? And, and, and a lot of bad things happened to them, and they did a lot of bad things. But in the end, they find Jesus. And you think, look at what the grace of God has done. All their testimonies might be different, but it's irrelevant what the testimony is the, the testimony is all about the grace of God that saved them. Amen? It has to be about God's grace. The incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. You got to believe. You got to hook. Take your faith believing. You hook it up to God's grace. It's God's grace and God's power comes to meet you and then your faith hooks up to it. Amen? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not for, from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. See, when we get born again, we are in God's workshop. <laughs> God has this giant workshop full of all of these souls that have come to him and accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And everybody's at a different stage in this workshop. Has anybody ever gone to, uh, anybody ever done ceramics? You know, when you, when you do ceramics, there's different stages in, in the shop. <laughs> and you get the clay, and it's kind of hard. You know, at one level, there's a place where you got to work water into the clay, and you pound it and keep working, get your hands all dirty, and you're working the clay and trying to soften the clay because it, until that clay gets soft enough, you're not going to be able to mold and shape it in anything. And a lot of 
a lot of young Christians, doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, you could be a Christian 30, 40, 50 years and still be a young Christian because you're still clay is hard as a rock. <laughs> you need to let God with the water and the pounding <laughs> soften your clay so that you will be moldable. Amen. So anyway, once you get the clay, that's that's one part of the workshop. This is God's workshop, and you could be God's just, and he's always going to be trying to soften us, right? And he's trying to soften the clay. And then, and when you get the clay soft and pliable enough, then you can mold it into something that's useful. Amen. Don't you want to be useful for the kingdom of God? Well, you got to get a softened heart first. And sometimes, sometimes it takes a licking. But you kill, you'll keep on ticking. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to have to take a licking in life because we come to God kind of stubborn and obstinate. And, you know, we still, you know, we'll do this, but we ain't going to do that. And, you know, okay, all right, believe in this, but I don't know if I believe in that. <laughs> come with our attitude. It takes time in that workshop, this big workshop of God with all these souls. And so once he get, we get soft and pliable enough, he keeps still having to apply that water. I don't know if you ever worked on a, a wheel, on a clay, and you have to keep, you know, shaping and molding. But you know, God wants to, it says there's all kind of vessels in a, in, a, in a house, in the kingdom, there's all kind of vessels. And so it's up to God to shape us. He's the one, at, it's his workshop, he's shaping us on the wheel. As the wheel of life goes round and round, God is shaping us into the vessel that he wants to use us. Amen. Whether it be a bowl or a cup or a vase to hold a flower. You know, whether it be a full-time ministry or whatever we're called to do and in the so many things that we could be called and different, different callings and different giftings and different abilities and different places. And, and, you know, there's so many different things in that shop. And God only knows how to shape the clay for the purpose in which it was attended. So then you have to let this clay dry. So you might feel like you're on a shelf. <laughs> you feel like you're in some type of a shape, but you feel like you're just drying out. That's all right. You have to dry out. And then, and then you don't know how long you're going to be sitting there until God takes you off the shelf to put a little glaze on you. And then God decides what kind of glaze and what kind of pattern and what kind of colors and what it's going to look like, what you're going to look like when you're all done. So he makes those decisions. And all the while, from the time we come in as just a lump of hard clay, we are fighting the system, <laughs> fighting the process, fighting the system. I don't want to get beat around. I don't want God telling me what to do. I don't want to have to obey this, and I don't want to. Have to I don't want to be there, and I don't have to go do this, and I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to. And the, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and God's no, I didn't tell you to do this, and I didn't tell you to do that. So all that's all getting pounding all these things out of us. When are you going to do my will? When are you going to do what I tell you to do? And so God is working on the clay. You know, most, you know, a lot of Christians don't even want to get on the wheel. <laughs> oh, you're on the wheel. <laughs> you're spinning in circles. <laughs> but it, it's a process. So, so then God will, you know, we have to be on the shelf. And we have to draw for a while. And then, you know, you get glazed. And it's like, oh, I don't like that color. I don't want to do that. God, I want to do this. Why are you making me do this? And why are you making me say this? <laughs> Amen. So we're fighting the system the whole way. And then after that, after all the pounding, after all the sitting on the shelf and drying out, aren't we the clay and isn't he the potter? <laughs> I'm just telling Bible stories here. <laughs> and then, then, then after the glaze, then you have to sit. And then you put you in the kiln. Now we're going to go through the fire. Now we're going to find out what a real test is like. You got to be, you got to go through the fire because you're not really good unless you've been in the kiln for a while. They don't put you in there for five minutes. It's not a microwave. <laughs> this is not microwave Christianity. It's a kiln. They don't. They leave you in there for a long time. 
They leave you in there overnight, and then they got to let it cool down. Sit in there until you cool down a little bit. <laughs> Amen. And then perhaps after all that, then God could use us. And all the while, you could fight the system and not make any progress. Because it's really about what God wants, right? We're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This means he prepared this before you were ever conceived. From the foundations of the earth, God had a vision of you out of the kiln and how you would look at the end. So because he already sees the finished product, he knows how to get you there. He knows how to on the clay. He knows what to shape you into. He knows how to shape you. And he knows you need to dry out. Get rid of that attitude. He knows what color and how he's going to glaze you and decorate you. He knows what kind of gifts and giftings and all that stuff he's going to give you and put on you and, and then he's going to put you through the fire. Amen. We're, we're, his, <clears throat> we're his handiwork. Amen. That he prepared long time ago for us to do. Some of us are still on the wheel and he's trying to mold us and shape us. And we're fighting the system instead of just saying, I surrender all. <laughs> what is that? Will you shape me? Do what you want, God. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, but God demonstrates, this is the NIV, but God demonstrates his own love <clears throat> for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us so much and had so much hope in our futures and saw such a beautiful product at the end of our lives. And it doesn't have to be at the end of our lives, but the end of all of this preparation, he saw such a beautiful product in Christ, in love, by grace, through faith, with God's mercy. He saw all of this about each and every one of us individually. Amen? And it's not about that one piece. It's not about the one piece. It's about the master who made many pieces so that when you come in now, that's, that's just the pre preparation. You ever go to, a, uh, I think it was called Mikasa. They made all kind of dinnerware and servingware. And I really liked their stuff. It was beautiful, you know. And, um, but, but when you go to the store to see all this beautiful stuff in the store, it came from a shop. <laughs> it came from a workshop. So you can't go to a store and see all, all this beautiful stuff on display. That means all the wonderful things that God has made and prepared for his people until you've been through the workshop. Amen. And this is all because of his love for us, even while we were dead in sin. Amen. In the New Living Translation, it says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. <laughs> You're beating and pounding and sitting and drying out and going through the kiln and pushing around, having to do things you don't want to do and don't like to do and all the stuff that's going on. <clears throat> will not lead to disappointment. I am here to say, it doesn't matter what God asks you to do, is directing you to do, whether you want to do it or don't want to do it, just do it. Because it never leads to disappointment. We know when we get off and start going the wrong direction, it always leads to disappointment. <clears throat> Has anybody ever been disappointed in here? It's because we went down the wrong path. We did the wrong thing. We, we resisted going the way of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But following him will never disappoint us. 
For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Every one of those pots, no matter what shape and how big and what color, what the calling, what, what the work, what anything specifically, and all the parts and all the different giftings, and all, no matter what kind of pot you are, we all must understand that in that pot, it must be filled with something, something. And that something needs to be the love of God. He made us to be containers of him. We're earthen vessels, and he made us to be vessels and containers full of his love. And so he has given us his Holy Spirit. How many got the Holy Ghost? We got to let the Holy Ghost have his way in us. Because he, because because the very reason that he has given us the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is to fill our hearts with his love. Amen. This is a God of love that cares about us so dearly and so deeply that he gave us his very spirit to fill us, to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to show us, to comfort us. To be our advocate, everything that we need, we have by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. We have his spirit right now in us to be everything that we can be wherever we're at in our walk right now. We don't have to wait till we get to the china shop <laughs> to be of value. Amen. <clears throat> How vitally important is that? We have been filled with the Holy Spirit so that we, of all the things that we could possibly have of God, is that we could be filled with his love. Amen? Filled with his love. I want to read something in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. Amen? And this is in the very end of chapter this is 1 Corinthians, the very end of chapter 12. And this is talking about, you know, we're talking about this whole chapter. And just with time, you could read this. We just read this a couple services ago. And this is all concerning the spiritual gifts and all the different, different kind of um, parts of the body and the giftings and the different calls, right? And how we all are diverse, diversified. <laughs> we all have, we have diversity in here. <laughs> We got diversity. <laughs> and um, so anyway, he's talking about all these different things and about your callings and about your giftings. And, you know, Paul's telling the Corinthian church, you know, all the diversity of every human being is different. There's no one, two people that are going to be the same. So he's talking about all these different callings and giftings and everything. And then he ends it with it. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. After he gets done telling him all about the apostle, prophet, pastor, pastor, teachers, and all the different callings and, and <clears throat> prophets and working of miracles and the gifts of healing and different, all of these different things that we can, all of these things that God has given the church, <clears throat> right? And then he ends it with, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. <clears throat> in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, if I speak in tongues, of men or angels. So that means you can speak in tongues of men and angels. You can speak in different tongues. Amen. But do not have love. I'm only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. That means you, that doesn't mean you stop speaking in, in languages or tongues of men and angels, but it needs, need to make sure that we understand that speaking in tongues doesn't mark spirituality. Speaking in tongues is an evidence that you have the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't mark spirituality because spirituality, we're all spirits. We're spiritual. 
but it's not a mark of some kind of spirituality. So, in verse 2, he says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So all the goody two-shoeing that people try to do thinking they're going to make brownie points is nothing if we don't have love. And then it goes into describing what love is, which we hear at all the weddings. You know, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't even, it doesn't boast, it's not rude, proud of we have an understanding of love and what God's kind of love is and how it looks and how we act. But the best way to know and be fully acquainted with the love of God is to spend time with the love of God. Spend time with God. Spend time in his love. Spend time in his forgiveness. So many people go around living under condemnation and guilt and shame. As Christians... And it all comes from an unrenewed mind, not knowing and understanding that God is love and he loves you. It doesn't come from condemnation <laughs> and guilt and shame. Do not come from without. It comes from within when we don't know within that we are God's prime possession and that he loves us so much that he paid the price, the ultimate price, by suffering and dying on the cross, shedding his blood for all mankind. So if we understand that, see what it says right there, you can have all the power in the world, but if you don't have the God kind of love, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing but a hound dog <laughs> if you don't have the God kind of love, not the earthly kind of love. And well, I'm really nice. I'm kind. I do all these things. It doesn't matter if you have this word and these things in operation. It has to come from the heart because the world can act this way. But it's not the God kind of love. It's just acting like it without it. But we have the God kind of love. And we have to be familiar with the God kind of love. And not just the letters on the page, but the presence that is in us and that surrounds us. We have to be in God's love. We have to be very familiar and acquainted with that love that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Amen? It's, it's let what we do not come from this outward. I'm going to be, you know, I, I've, I've met all kind of religious people and all kind of sinners that can act all of these things out. They can act all this stuff out. But it doesn't come from the God, love, love of God. It doesn't come from the God kind. It has to come from something within the spirit. This walking in love has to come from the walking of God's love. Amen. Thank God that he's given us something here in Ephesians 3. I'm going to read this. This is the New Living Translation. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources. <laughs> Say that again. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. This is that inner strength to walk the God kind of love which is walking in love and forgiveness and compassion and mercy towards mankind. Amen? Letting the God kind of love come out from within us. I pray that as glorious and limited resources, he will empower you with 
inner strength through his spirit, then Christ will make his home in our hearts as you trust in him. And we're talking about the God of love. This is the ultimate relationship. Then Christ will make his home within our hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You want strength in times of tests and trials. You want strength in times of questioning. You want strength. Let the roots of God's love grow deep within. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. To the degree that we trust in him, he will be at home in us because we are making a place for him. If we don't trust God, we're not making a place for him in our lives. But the more we trust him, the more place that we make for him in our lives. Then Christ will make us home in your hearts as you trust in him and your roots, your, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to, full, to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. We want the end result, don't we? How many of you do not want the fullness of life and power? <laughs> you can ask any sinner, any saint, you can ask them. Would you like to have the fullness of life and power? Everybody would say, amen. But here it says, it only comes from God. And it comes from being fully acquainted with him and who he is. And that is love. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down, this is what Jesus said, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us, and he called us his friends. He calls us friends, and he gave, paid the ultimate sacrifice because of his love because of the God kind of love. This is the relationship that God paid for us to have. He paid for us to have it on this planet, in this life, that we would walk in the garden with love. See, when Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God, they walked in the garden with love. They walked in the garden with, they walked in that secret place with love. They walked with love. They were becoming fully acquainted with love. Amen. When we find that secret place, the garden in our life, the place where it's just you and God, you will become fully acquainted with love. And the more you keep going back there and facing that love, it melts away condemnation. It melts away guilt and shame. It melts away everything because you find out that you are the beloved in Christ. This is the ultimate relationship. Our ultimate sacrifice is to just surrender all. What are we surrendering? A lot of people are, I don't know, I can't surrender all. Well, that just shows how ignorant a person could possibly be because you're surrendering to love. If you are withholding anything from God, you're really withholding it from love. So we, as human beings, as individuals, have to make sure that we're surrendered to his love because he is love. He already paid the, ulti the ultimate sacrifice. That doesn't mean there's no more sacrifices left. The sacrifice we pay is put, that we have to pay is when our flesh and our unrenewed mind are, are, are fighting against 
the love of God. Amen. It's all about God. And if it's all about God, it's all about love. God wants, he wants us so, he wants us so deeply to know his love for us. Not, not his love for other people. I mean, that, that'll come as you know God's love for you. When we have a deep, a clear understanding of God's love for us, then it'll become easier and easier to surrender our lives to him. No greater tell in life than a person that's not surrendered to God and his will, that they are not acquainted or spending time with that love. Amen. You have to spend time with the love or you will do it, try to do it in the flesh. It's just like the story I was telling you when years ago, you know, I thought, you know, I, I knew I had a call of God on my life. I wanted to be this fire evangelist and go around you know, the world and just praying people and getting healed and, you know, thousands coming to the altars and, you know. <laughs> so I just had thought, ah, that's what I would want to do. And one day I'm just in that secret place. I was driving my car in the secret place. I was by myself just driving and worshiping God and the presence of God just filled my car. And I'm just loving on God and he's loving on me. And I was just thinking, gosh, if, if, if people could just experience this, they would surrender to God. I'm thinking they just don't know how awesome you are, God, and how awesome your love and your presence is. And I was like, God, I just, if there was some way for people to just, to just experience this, this love. And it was just so awesome. I just, at that moment, I just, you know, my whole life was surrendered to God. Everything, just whatever you want, God. I'm in the presence of the love of God. If you're in the presence of God, you're in the presence of love. I was like, oh, Lord, anything, <laughs> anything, what do you want? And he said, will you teach them? Now, up to this point, that was the last thing I wanted to do was be a teacher. <laughs> but he caught me off guard. I was so snuggled up to his love. And then he asked me to do something. And of course I said, yes, Lord, I'll do anything. And then, you know, just praise God. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, wait, wait. wait. What did you just say? <laughs> wait, what did you say? What did I say? <laughs> Wait, what, what just happened? <laughs> did I just <laughs> did I just surrender something that I I didn't even think about it? Because we don't need to think about it. We just get in the presence of God. And let me just say, God has brought that back to me in that car. I can tell you exactly where I was driving on Dixie Highway in Richton Park, Illinois, driving northbound by the Bozo Hot Dogs. <laughs> I was right there. I can tell you right there. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh. There's many times that God brought that back. He said, you said, when I struggled with it, then he says to me, but remember what you said. You said, yes, Lord. And then I say, yes, Lord. Amen. We're just the vessels, and he shapes us and uses us to how he designed us to be in the first place. And when you get there, oh, the rewards, and you can't even imagine doing anything else. Amen. Sometimes you don't need to know the details. You just say, yes, Lord. Just say, yes, Lord, whatever, whatever. When you get in the presence of love, say, yes, Lord, here I am. Just, I surrender all. Yes, Lord. Amen. Because you're surrendering to love. God so loved you that he sent Jesus. Because he saw the end product. He saw the end product. He says, I, he wasn't looking at our messes. He wasn't looking at our messes. He was looking at the end product. He was looking at you in the china shop and seeing how you looked. 
all prepped and ready. Amen. I'll take that. I'll t I'll take that lump of clay, and I'll take that lump of clay, and I want that lump of clay, and I'll have that lump of clay because I know what I can do with a lump of clay. Amen. So if you feel like you've gotten beaten on the shelf or if you're in the heat, you're just in the process. Amen. Just keep surrendering. It's way easier than fighting against. Just keep surrendering. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, the devil knows and does not want you to know the love of God for you. Because the one thing that he can fight against a lot of things. The devil can fight in our lives against a lot of things. And a lot of times, you know, it's about, you know, even in the even as a Christian and in ministry and walking and having revelation knowledge and understanding some of the word of God and having some power and even having some demonstrations and some healings and you know, having some testimonies and all of these things he can fight against, but he cannot fight against your revelation of the love of God. He does not. He is fighting tooth and toenail against you receiving a revelation of how much God loves you. You are the finest piece of China that God has on the shelf. And he's trying to get you to that point. Amen. But he's going to get it, get you there with love. Amen. Love doesn't look like what the world looks like. Love, love puts up and says, okay, you know, okay, well, if that's what you feel, is that if that's what you identify as, God doesn't put up with that. We have to identify ourselves as in Christ. That means we are dead in Christ. Amen? We are, we are dead ourselves, but alive in his love. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his ability. Thank God for his grace. But thank God for his love. Hallelujah. His prayer was that we would know his love experience. That's just not knowing by reading it. Oh yeah, I read about that love. No, it's experiencing. Know the love. That means you've experienced the love. How many of you have ever experienced God's love? Amen. Let me see a show of hands. You ever experienced God's love and mercy and forgiveness? Amen. If you're still alive, you have experienced God's love. 